Hey, I shall take your cloak, miss. No, thank you, Barbara. Is there anyone in the teacher's room? Uh, I don't know, miss. Uh, shall I bring a pot of tea to warm you? No, thank you. I wish to be alone for a moment. Miss Eyre, you are back at last. You said I might go to the village, Miss Watts. Yes, and I acceded to your plea to perform an errand there yesterday and the day before and every day of my short time here. I hope I have not been remiss in my duties. Indeed, you performed them well, as I was led to expect when I took over the superintendentship from Miss Temple. She spoke of you in the most glowing terms. I would not wish to have disappointed you, Miss Watts. It is disconcerting when a teacher I'd been led to expect would give me strong support quits the premises in such haste. And if I may say so, agitation every afternoon. One wonders what is the reason. It shall not happen again, Miss Watts. Let us hope not. Well, you know where she goes, the post office. Oh, how would you know? Oh, Tom was wag, especially that old postmistress. Oh, well, no, well, she says anything. Well, now, every afternoon this week into the post office comes Miss Eyre to see if there's a letter for J.E. And when she finds this one, she marches out with a face like a funeral. <gasps> I believe it is your turn to take the girls' study hour this evening. Yes, Miss Watson, then I read prayers to them and see them to bed. Do not let them make you late for teacher's supper. J.E. is in a position to give satisfactory references. A situation can be offered where there is but one pupil, a little girl, and where the salary is £30 per annum. All particulars to Mrs. Fairfax Thornfield near Milcott. Very well, Barbara, but do not let it occur again. That is all. You may go. Miss Watts, you wish to speak to me, Miss Eyre? If I may, Miss Watts, it concerns a matter of much importance to me. I am very busy, Miss Eyre, but if it's urgent, speak now. Miss Watts, I have the possibility of another situation. You wish to leave, Lowood? It is a situation where the salary would be £30 per annum, double the amount I'm receiving now. And you would like me to lay the matter before Mr Brocklehurst? If you would, I would be most grateful. Mrs Reed, as your natural guardian, will need to be approached for her consent. Mrs Reed will not care what happens to me. And then, Miss Eyre, the matter must be laid before the committee. It may take some time, but I have no doubt that since you've always conducted yourself well, a testimonial of courage and capacity will be furnished you. Thank you, Miss Watts. Oh, Miss Eyre, I was just coming for you. There's a person just arrived who wishes to see you. Oh, that'll be the carrier of my box. No, no, this is a young woman. The carrier won't come for another half hour. Now, he's to take my box to the inn. I shall be there in the morning to take the coach. Who's the visitor? It's her, I'm sure. I could have told her anywhere. Well, who is it? You've not forgotten me, Miss Eyre. Oh, Betty, Betty, <laughs> Betty. Oh. oh. Oh, Barbara, this is a very dear old friend, Bessie. She was my nurse at Gateshead. <clears throat> the only one who was ever kind to me. Oh, well, that'll be one more for tea then, Miss Eyre. Oh, dear, where can we go and talk? The teacher who shares my room is studying up there. The teacher's room is empty, Miss. Come, we've so much to talk about. Bessie, you're married. Yes, I've been married nearly five years to Robert Levin, the coachman. Oh, I remember him. He's an excellent man. We've a little boy named Bobby and a little girl named, guess what? What? Jane. <laughs> oh, Bessie, thank you. And have you left Gateshead? No, the old porter left and we were put into lodge. You've not grown so very tall, Miss Jane, nor so very stout. I fear you're disappointed in me, Bessie. Come and sit down. Well, no, not exactly. You were genteel, and now you look like a lady, and it's as much as I ever expected of you. Well, you were never a beauty as a child. I dare say you're clever, though. What can you do? Can you play on piano? A little. I always said you could surpass them, and you have. What else can you do? Can you draw? That is one of my paintings over the fireplace. Oh, well, that is beautiful. Bessie, did my aunt send you? 
Oh, Lord, no. But she did have a letter saying you were going away to another place. So I thought I'd set off and have a look at you before you went quite away. Oh, bless you. You'll want to hear about family. Well, Miss Georgiana is very handsome and nearly ran off Wheat Lord, but her sister told on her now they quarrel like cat and dog. Mr John is a great disappointment. He were put to study law, but it were no use, and now he's ruining his health with bad living. Your aunt is well enough to look at, but she's breaking her heart over Mr. John, and I fear it'll be the death of her. For only yeah, last... Bessie, please, I want no news of the family. They've never sought any of me. Let us talk of ourselves. Well, never. Well, did Mrs. not write and tell you when man came? What man? Well, you know how Mrs. Reed always said your father's people were poor and despicable. Well, they may be poor, but I believe they're as much gentry as the Reeds are. For one day, oh... It must be seven years ago, and Mr Eyre came to Gateshead asking to see you. I was sure Mrs must have written to tell you. She's never written. Oh, dear. Well, Mrs told him you were at school some 50 miles off. He seemed so much disappointed, for he was going away to a foreign country, and his ship was to sail in a day or two. He looked very much the gentleman, and I think he was your father's brother. And what foreign country was he going to, Bessie? Oh... An island, thousands of miles off, where, where they make wine. The butler did tell me. Oh. Madeira? Yes, yes, that's it. That's the very word. And he went away? Yes, he, he did not stay many minutes in house. Missus were very high with him. Afterwards, she called him a sneaking tradesman. My Robert believes he were a wine merchant. Perhaps. Or a clerk or an agent to a wine merchant. Mm. Miss Jane, I cannot stay long. A wagoner is passing who will carry me home. Not until you've had a good meal and a rest. Come, Barbara must have that tea ready by now. We'll go to the kitchen and talk and talk and talk. I must tell you what has happened, but I'm starting a new life. No. Yes. Field, Mum. Please come in. John will take your box up to your room. Hi, it's all us, John. Will you walk this way, Mum? How do you do, my dear? How do you do, Mom? Mrs. Fairfax, I think. Yes, you are right. I'm afraid you've had a tedious ride from Milkwood. John drives slowly. And were you long in the coach before that? The coach left Luton at four o'clock this morning. I had to rise before three o'clock. Oh, you must be tired. Come and sit down. Is this not your chair? No, I shall be comfortable enough here. And your hands look numb with cold. Leah, are the refreshments ready? Yes, Mum. And, and make some hot negus as well. The water's boiling, Mum. I hope I shall have the pleasure of seeing Miss Fairfax tonight. I was glad to arrive before nightfall, hoping to see my young pupil. Miss Fairfax. Miss Fairfax? Oh, you mean Miss Barnes. Barnes is the name of your future pupil. Barnes? Yes. <laughs> oh, yes, thank you, Leah. Sip that negus and warm yourself. Indeed, then, she is not your daughter. No, I have no family. But I am so pleased you are come. It will be quite pleasant having someone with whom to talk. Thornfield is a fine old hall, but in the quiet season, you know, one feels dreary. Quite alone. Well, I say quite alone. Leah, my maid, is a nice enough girl, to be sure. And John and his wife, well, are very decent people. But then, you see, they are only servants. 
Well, eat that food, Miss Eyre. Don't stand on ceremony. You may eat and listen to me prattling. I have had the room next to mine prepared for you. It is only a small apartment, but I thought you would like it better than one of the large front chambers. To be sure, the front chambers have finer furniture, but they are so large and solitary. I never sleep in there myself. Here we are. Oh, it is beautiful. Thank you, Mrs. Fairfax, and thank you for your kindness. Kindness? Oh, rubbish. <laughs> now I have someone with whom I can talk. <laughs> but I won't come in and keep you from your bed with my chatter. Good night, my dear. Good night, Mrs. Fairfax. Good morning, my dear. I see you are an early riser. It's all so beautiful. Every moment is precious. <laughs> Come in, my dear. I have some tea in my room. The tea is just right. And how did you like Thornfield? Oh, I like it very much. Yes, it is a pretty place. But I fear it will be getting out of order. If Mr. Rochester doesn't take it into his head to come and reside here permanently. Mr. Rochester, who is he? Well, the owner of Thornfield. Did you not know his name was Rochester? I thought Thornfield belonged to you. To me? Oh, oh bless you, child. Oh, what an idea. No, I am only the housekeeper, the manager. To be sure, I am distantly related to the Rochesters, or, or rather my husband was. He was a clergyman, you know, incumbent of Hay, the little village beyond the hill. The present Mr. Rochester's mother was a Fairfax and second cousin to my husband. But I never presume on the connection. My employer is always civil and I expect nothing more. And the little girl, my pupil? Oh, she is Mr. Rochester's ward. And he asked me to engage a governess for her. Oh. I hear her. Come, let me introduce you. And after your schoolwork is finished, I shall show you round the house. Good morning, Miss Adele. Come and meet the lady who is to teach you and turn you into a clever woman one day. Bonjour, Madame Fairfax. Enchanté, Mademoiselle. Alors, tu es française? I did not imagine I had a foreign pupil. Miss Adele was born on the continent, I believe, and has been in England only six months. She speaks English quite well, but is rather unwilling to do so. I can get little out of her. Uh, this is Sophie, her bonne, as she calls her nurse. Mademoiselle? Nous aurons bien des choses à faire ensemble, Sophie. Oh, oui, bien sûr. Ah, elle parle parfaitement français. Hmm? Yes, my dear, I had a very good teacher. And I practiced every day for many years. Do you understand me? Yes, mademoiselle. Excellent. And since you are to speak English like an English lady, from now on we will speak only English. I will try, mademoiselle. Mais quelquefois... <laughs> try. You will succeed. What is your name? Jane Eyre. Eyre. I wish you could ask her some questions about her parents. You will learn more than I could. Adele, you live in Paris? Mais oui, mademoiselle. Yes, mademoiselle. With whom did you live? I lived long ago with Mama, but she's gone to the Holy Virgin. Oh, poor little lamb. And after that? We live with some poor people, but Mr. Rochester ever knew. 
He came. He asked if I would like to live with him in England, for I knew him when my mama was alive, and he gave me the belle robe de chouette. Pretty dresses and toys. But now he has left me all alone, and he's not here. He has had to go abroad again. I can sing and dance and speak many poems. Shall I dance, et vous verrez? Uh, not now, dear. We have a lovely schoolroom ready for you with a pianoforte and globes and all that you will need. Shall I show it to you? Please do, uh, Mrs. Fairfax. Uh, Sophie, you will have much to do during lesson time. Madame? Sophie? Vous aurez des choses à faire pendant nos leçons. Oh, oui, mademoiselle. Come along, then. Come, my dear. I wish to play in the garden first. Afterwards. In England, little girls do as they're told. Come along, I want to hear you sing. Très bien. my dear. Your morning school hours are over now? Yes. The schoolroom is admirable. You keep everything in such good order. <laughs> Why, Miss Eyre, although Mr. Rochester's visits here are rare, they are always sudden and unexpected. So I keep his house in instant readiness. Is Mr. Rochester such an exacting, fastidious man? Oh, he has a gentleman's tastes and habits. He expects to find his house managed in accordance with them. Do you like him? Is he generally liked? Oh, yes. The Rochesters have owned most of the land here, time out of mind, and the family have always been respected. But do you like him? Well, I have no cause but to like him. And so do his tenants, to whom he is generous, although he's hardly ever among them. But has he no peculiarities? I mean, what is his character? He is a very good master. Is that all you know of him? Well, his, his character is unimpeachable, I suppose. I dare say he is peculiar. He travels a great deal and has seen a great deal of the world, I should think. I dare say he is clever, but I have never had much conversation with him. In what way is he peculiar? I don't know. It is not easy to describe. You feel it when he speaks to you. You cannot really be sure whether he is in jest or earnest, whether he is pleased or the contrary. You do not thoroughly understand him, or at least I do not. <laughs> but he is a very good master. Now, I promised to show you round the house, didn't I? Thank you. Oh. I did not imagine you had such grand apartments. I dared not hope to see anything like it in my life. It is only the dining room and the drawing room. I open the curtains every day to air the rooms. And every bedroom ready for use? Oh, the master will not catch me napping. Well, now you have seen the whole house. I have not seen the upper floor yet. Oh, there is nothing to see. Well, you told me there was a wonderful view from the leads. You wish to go up on the roof? Oh, well, very well. Mrs. Fairfax, for some reason, was uneasy lest I should prolong my enjoyment of it. Thank you for taking so much trouble. I would not have missed such a pleasing prospect. This is a grand country. Do the servants sleep in these rooms? Oh, no, the servants sleep at the back. No one sleeps here. Oh, surely you have a ghost. Ghost? Oh, not that I know of. <laughs> Mrs. Fairfax, did you hear that laugh? Who is it? One of the servants, most likely. Oh, perhaps Grace Poole. Uh, she sews up here, and, and sometimes Lear is with her, and they are noisy. Grace? Grace? Too much noise, Grace. Remember directions. She does the sewing and helps with the housework. She's a little too fond of Porter. 
but she works well enough. Let us go down. It is too disagreeable here. We do not want our dinner cold, do we? Mm. I could sit and dream on those lids for hours. I should not go up there again if I were you. The wind, it can come in terrible gusts. It is dangerous. Anyone may blame me who likes, but often in the next few months, when I was free, I climbed to the roof where I could look out to the far skyline and long to reach past it to the busy world beyond. I had the promise of a smooth career. My pupil had been spoilt and indulged, but soon became obedient and teachable. Yet in spite of my blessings, I was restless at my tranquility. I could not help it. The restlessness was in my nature. There must be millions like me, I thought, who must have action. Women especially who wish for more than their narrow lot. Mrs. Poole. Are you not well? <laughs> This'll cure it, miss. a letter for Mrs. Fairfax. But it's two miles over at Hill, and it's bitter cold up there most times, and it will get dark terrible soon. I shall enjoy the walk, and I like the dark. Hurt, sir. Can I help you? Stand aside. I can fetch help, sir. Oh, I've no broken bones. It's only a sprain. I shall stay with you until I can see you can mount your horse. You should be at home. Where do you come from? Thornfield Hall. I've been to post a letter. Thornfield? I'm a governess there. Ah, yes. The governess. Come here. Excuse me. Necessity compels me to make you useful. Stand aside. Thank you. I love. There you are. The master is here. He has had a fall. His ankle is sprained. I have just taken Mr. Carter, the surgeon, to him. He cannot even get up. Of course he can. You should not be standing up, sir. Dr. Carter, I have the aid of your good self. You are Mr. Rochester. An intelligent deduction. 
Miss, uh... Miss Eyre! Miss Eyre! I should be glad if you would take tea with me tomorrow. 6 p.m. Good night, Miss Eyre. Yes, sir. Good night, sir.